in what a child of God must do if he's going to keep new information coming and new excitement, he is going to have to set some goals that, that are honoring to God, and he's going to have to work and dig. No longer can he stand around the surface of the, the opening of the mind and pick jewels from the, because the jewels have all been picked, and his pockets are full of them. So what he's going to have to do now is he's going to have to get a shovel and start digging. He's going to have to get a pick and start digging. And he's going to wind up with some bruised knuckles and some bumped heads and some skint, skint knees because now he's going to have to dig. Now the tragedy is the average child of God is too lazy to dig because Bible study is work. Bible study is hard work. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul calls it laboring in doctrine. So as long as we're dealing with surface and always finding new things, that's exciting. But eventually, we've absorbed most of the surface newness, and now then, uh, we have to look for a new thing. Fellows who have been coming to this church five years, uh, he has to purposely listen and pray that God will give him something new, something new. You have, to, you have to look for it, and it may not be there every time. And when a fellow says, I can't get anything new, then his average reaction is this. Well, I just don't get anything out of your services anymore. Folks say it all the time. Well, I, I just don't think you can teach me anything anymore. Folks will say that. I just can't get anything out of your church service anymore. Well, I, first of all, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe that you can get something out of everybody and everything if you are conditioned. Uh, go to the ant, thou sluggard. I think an ant can teach you something if you're willing to learn. Solomon said, I saw a, 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 a wall that was overgrown with a vine, and I took knowledge. In other words, in most cases, the problem is not the teacher, but in the conditioning of the student. Isn't it interesting someone can come to church and say, I didn't get a thing out of that. Right behind them, someone will say, Preacher, best sermon I ever heard. What's the problem? Well, I do believe teachers must study, and they must prepare, and they must have some food for their people. At the same time, we who are learners must prepare ourselves, and we must be hungry. God said, Blessed is he that hungers and thirsts for righteousness. He will be filled. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Study to show yourself approved unto God. So the child of God needs to, to earnestly uh, want to grow in grace. A fellow said one time, he said, uh, uh, God, I want your power. And you'd be surprised, if I ask you this morning, how many of you want the power of God, I would imagine every hand would go up. But if I came around to you individually and I looked you in the face and I said, what do you need the power of God for? Some of you'd have a hard time. Now, if you don't know what you need power for, then how do you know you need it? As a matter of fact, if you don't know what you need it for, why do you want it? Fellas, pray for me, preacher. I want the power of God to do what? Your daughter walks in or your son says, Dad, I want to borrow your car. So when you and I say, I want God's power, God says, for what? So many times when we talk about the power of God, we don't know what we're talking about. Now, I'm convinced if you, when you talk about the power of God, if you'll pinpoint it, you will find that God will give you the power to do the thing that you want to do. Fellow says, boy, I'm really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a church member and I'm, uh, I'm really tempted to quit. I'm really being tested. I'm, the devil's tested me. I know, that, I know God wants me to go to church and be faithful, but the devil is tempting me. And I just sometimes think the devil's winning. So pray for me that I'll have the power of God to what? To withstand the devil and stay in church and do right, specific. So when we talk about the power of God, for what? You know why a lot of folks want the power of God? Because they want the praise that they think is heaped on. We, we, sometimes we say, boy, that fellow's really got the power of God. So we turn around, we say, well, if I could have the power of God, people would applaud me.
So sometimes when we talk about wanting the power of God, all we're wanting is the applause that we think goes with it. The power of God is not to lose your temper on the freeway. That's where you may need the power of God. You maybe. You've got a boss at work that's giving you a fit, and you'd just kind of like to tell him off or quit your job, and you may need the power of God to keep your temper under. Maybe you've got an alcoholic problem. Maybe alcohol is, uh, is, has got you by the uh, ring in the nose and leading you around, and uh, you, they're having a big party down at work, and you're required to be there, and you know that uh, you know you shouldn't be drinking that slop, and so you say, I need the power of God. Specifically, you see, God, I want your power if I have to be there. I want the power of God to, to resist this stuff. The question I would like to ask you is, what kind of goals do you have? And by looking at those goals, you can tell if God is in them. What are your goals? What three goals do you think you might have? Think it through. What three goals do you really have? Now, there's a real problem in goal setting. It's not as simple as you might think. And in the church, in the church, there is a, there is a mentality that goes on in the church that there's a segment of professing Christendom, and you'll find folks in this church, perhaps, that have a problem with setting goals because they feel that goal setting is not spiritual. I know some of you fellows that work in the world, you can't believe that, but there are Christians who believe that it is not spiritual to set goals. They believe that if you set goals, that you are usurping the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit. So consequently, you should not set goals, but you should just let God lead. And those are spiritual, that's spiritual jargon that you'll hear thrown around all the time. Oh, we're not setting any goals, just letting the Holy Spirit lead. Now, folks, I know that sounds pious, I know, I know you mean well, but that's not the way it works. It just isn't the way it works. Now, goals, by setting goals, it really activates your faith. Faith is believing that God wants you specifically to do something. That's what faith is. Faith is not just believing, I just believe in God, and just believe God. What do you mean you believe God? Well, I believe what God says. Okay, what does God say to you? Oh, he says just be faithful. Nah, come on. What if you got hired at work and the didn't give you a job description? He said, I just want you to be faithful. There's the factory. Why? He said, man, I don't understand this. No, what he's going to do is he not only wants you to be a faithful employee and part of a team, the, t the company team, but he will give you specifics that he wants you to do. Then you say, I believe my boss wants me to do this, and I believe that if I do it, I'll please him, and I believe if I do it, he'll pay me. So you're doing it all, it's your faith in action, believing what he told you to do. That's all faith is. When I came here 17 years ago to Linwood, I believed that God wanted me here, and so I set a goal to come. And I came. I put action to my faith. I set a goal. And I believe that God wanted me to do it. When we bought this piece of property, I believed that God wanted me to do it, and I set goals to do it set goals when to get it, how much to pay for it, when to pay for it, and how much to pay on a monthly basis. So you take your faith and you bring it down and you make it real. Faith without that, folks, is not real. It's just pie in the sky. You're just talking. So what you do is you believe, Moses, for example, believed that God wanted him to go from Egypt to Canaan. He believed it. So they started making, they had a goal, and they started making preparations. Joshua believed that God wanted him to go around the Jericho, so they sat down, they had a goal, they sat down, they made some plans. Jesus believed that his, was, was, his goal was to go to the cross. So he had some plans, and when the fullness of time was come, he did that which he believed God wanted him to do. You don't find people in the Bible blown about by, by the wind. Jesus said, I must keep this feast up at Jerusalem. He said his face is a plant to go to Jerusalem. So question, what kind of goals do you have? You ought to write down at least three. Now, as I said, uh, there's a real problem in Christianity in this matter of setting goals. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13, please. Hebrews 13, 5. 
<clears throat> and I see a lot of frustrated Christians not being able to balance this thing out of goal setting and trusting God. And most of our goals are all materialistic. <clears throat> and uh, the world has taught us that, you know. So the, quest, the question then is, I need to find the correct concept. I need to find the correct concept in this matter of setting goals because, now listen to me, a goal implies that the situation as it is now is going to be changed. Otherwise, you don't need a goal. Okay, example, you ladies, you walk into your living room and you look around at all the furniture. You're completely content or satisfied with the way it is. You're satisfied with the furniture, you're satisfied with the way it's arranged, you're satisfied with everything. Then obviously you aren't going to set any goals to change it, are you? So if you say, well, my goal when my husband comes home is for him to move this couch over here and to move this piano over here and to move this over here, you say. Now, that implies that you are not satisfied with the way the situation is. So anytime you set a goal, it's saying I'm going to change from the way it is now to the way I want it. Now the problem with the child of God is shouldn't a Christian be content? Shouldn't the housewife be satisfied? Why all this moving of the furniture? Good night. We brought it in here 15 years ago. Why do we have to move it? Can't you ever be content? So how do we balance this matter of setting goals and changing things with contentment? Usually when we don't want to change things, we say, oh, you ought to be content. You see, don't be given to change. But if we want to change things, we say, boy, I got the leadership of God, you see. Just, we play these games. So we need to balance these out. Now, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, as we think about God and goal setting, we need to think about this verse. He said, let your conversation, the word conversation is an old English word, which means behavior, not your, the way you talk with somebody as we think about a conversation today, but the word is behavior. Let your behavior be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now here we talk about goal setting and contentment. Another text would be Philippians 4.11. Let's go back to the left. To uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11. The Apostle Paul said, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now, I'll guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, one thing the American society does not have is contentment. They are not content, and the average Christian is not content. Not content. James says that the wicked are like the troubled sea, which cannot rest, whose water they talk, whose waters cast up dirt and mire. There is no peace or contentment, saith my God to the wicked. So the Apostle Paul said in this text, not that I speak out of respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. As a matter of fact, if you'll go with me to 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, let's go to the left again. <clears throat> I'm sorry, to the right. 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Look at verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw yourself. You know why? Because if you think gain is godliness, and you think gain is going to bring contentment, you'll never be godly and you'll never be content. You'll never, because you'll never reach it. So if you can't learn to be content with a dry morsel, you definitely are not going to be content with a house full, because those things will not bring contentment. The fellow said, well, if I could just have a thousand in Sunday school, I'd be content. No, you wouldn't. You won't. I'm not any more content with 500 than I was with 50, because I refuse to let the Sunday school attendance determine my contentment. 
But you see, many of us, we say, it's got to be a bigger car, then I'll be content. A bigger house, and then I'll be content. A bigger bank account, and then I'll be content. More of this and more of that, and then I'll be content. Well, why aren't you content? It won't happen. You see, and the real problem there is refusing to allow God to become your partner in your life. And if you believe God is leading you and, and you're following God's leadership and you're in God's will, well, you may not have done all that you would like to do. And I hope you haven't. And I hope you haven't reached all of your goals. But we're talking about this matter of being able to balance goal setting and contentment. And a lot of folks think, well, when I reach my goals, then I'll be content. You won't. Because when you reach your goals, the devil will move the contentment stake the stake will be moved. So you have to learn. Paul said, I have learned. And by the way, you learn it. You learn it. You don't pray it down. You learn it. A lady said to me last night, she said, uh, well, I want, I, want a, I want an answer for my life problems now. I said to her, ma'am, I said, your life problems didn't start yesterday and I can't solve them tomorrow. You see, these are things you learn. And so, in this text, it, it says that, uh, in verse 6, he says, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from uh, which, from withdraw yourself. Now, the question then, if I'm supposed to be content, and in whatsoever state I am to be content, and if I suppose that gain is godliness, then where do goals come into this picture? How can a child of God set goals? And by the way, this is why many Christians look at this side of it and say, well, that means you shouldn't set goals. You just should be content. Well, first of all, goal setting does not mean being passive. It does not mean being passive, or contentment does not mean being passive. You know, a fellow said, I'm just content. Late wife says, well, why should we clean up the house? I'm content. God says, be content. Sweetheart, be content. Don't worry about it. It's not only me deep yet. You know, trust God. Contentment doesn't mean being passive. And he says, oh, somewhere there's a car out there. You know, the grass is only four foot tall. I see the antenna over there. Don't worry about it, sweetheart. The Bible says be content. You just get right with God, you go mow the lawn. In other words, you understand? Contentment then doesn't mean being passive. Because the Bible says, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. The Bible says we're supposed to work. And I find too many people, they're content to just let the world go to hell. They're just content to let the grass grow and just content to let... That's not the kind of contentment the Bible's talking about. Contentment means that my desires should be limited. Should be limited to to that which I am convinced that God wants me to have. In other words, contentment means that my desire should be limited to that which I am convinced that God wants me to have and that which God wants me to achieve. In other words, I'm not satisfied that Open Door Baptist Church has reached all the people it ought to reach. But I am content that I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. You understand? That's the point. I'm not looking for something else because, you know, I haven't reached all my goals because the truth is I am never going to reach all my goals. My goals far outlive me. You see? But, you see, if you misunderstand what contentment is, you will die a frustrated person. You'll be afraid of old age because you say, man, I've got all these goals and I just can't reach them. And I'm so frustrated, life's getting away from me. And what your problem is, is you, 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 you haven't balanced contentment with goal setting. As a matter of fact, the goals that I have, that I believe God wants done here, I personally, I'm not sure that I'll ever live to see all of them. David didn't. David had a goal to have the temple built. And I believe David was content with God's plan, but David never lived to see it achieved. Solomon came along and did it for him. There's the, that's what we're talking about. And so the confusion is, we, if we can only be content as we reach all of our goals, we're going to be in big trouble. Because we're, we can set goals, 
that are not realistic. We can set goals that we have no control over. You have no control over the economy. So what if you set financial goals and the economy goes zero? What if Jimmy Carter resurrection gets back in? You see, you'll have to readjust all of your goals. So you see, there are things that you have no control on. Suppose your goal is to be an athlete, and you're going down the road, and some guy comes across the yellow line and, and puts you in the hospital. So you see, many of our goals, we have no control over them. And you're not going to reach most of your goals. But you should set lots of goals that you believe that are within the will of God. You have, to re you have to adjust them constantly. So there's no real uh, defeat in the Lord's work if you have done your best. There's only lessons. The fellow said, I looked at some goals that I have set <clears throat> for the church and for my own life, and I've not reached them. The fellow said, how does it feel to be a failure? I said, I don't know. I haven't failed. I haven't. And so a, prob uh, a problem then is being able to balance these. Now, when we look at these two ideas about goal setting and contentment, goal uh, contentment does not mean pa being passive. Goal, contentment, goal uh, uh, contentment means that my desire should be limited to that which I am convinced that God wants me to have and that which God wants me to achieve. Uh, the first of these spells laziness, and the second means lordship. Now, uh, I need to find out what God wants for me, and then this will eliminate my discouragement and depression. And uh, that's why I said at the, in, at the very beginning of our session this morning that you need to find out what God wants you to do, and then, then do it. Now, the second problem is uh, having previous defeat. It's very difficult to set goals and be optimi optimistic if you've been defeated in the past. The surest way to program yourself for defeat is to set goals and then digress from them. Pretty soon you'll say, well, it's no use. I've tried it before, and I've tried it before. And, and uh, you'll just program yourself to be defeat-oriented. And then you'll set goals, but subconsciously you're just going to say, well, you know, I've never done anything anyway, so I, I know. And what happens is you just begin to say that. You know, we've never done anything anyway, so we're not going to do anything. Well, the real problem there, again, is bringing God into your planning. Did, was God in those plans that you made before? Did you really seek God's leadership before you made them? So Dr. Naramore, Clyde Naramore, says, it's not easy to be enthusiastic about the future when one has not been successful in the past. Failure dims our outlook. Tomorrow seldom looks bright if yesterday's have been marred by dissatisfaction. There's nothing like failure to kill initiative and ambition. Now, people don't mind working hard when the reward is accomplishable and accomplished. But to work without results is not better than aimlessly marking time, that is, going around and around the same old rut getting nowhere, like a donkey at a treadmill. And that's when life be be becomes the grind, the same old grind. That's where the term comes from. A donkey going around grinding corn, going nowhere. Life becomes the same old grind. So <clears throat> it takes more than striving to develop a well-adjusted personality. It takes some arriving. Now, the world would have you to believe that goals is all that matters, but that's not true. You have to arrive. Some people say, matter of fact, there is a philosophy that says that the joy of life is in the traveling and not in the arriving. Well, if that were true and known to be true, then you would say, well, what's the use of traveling? Oh, just for the sake of traveling. But that's not the way God operates. God has some things that he wants you to accomplish that you can look back on. David did that when he faced Goliath. He looked back at a bear, he looked back at a lion, and he used those victories as stepping stones. Now, the way to have victories is to set victories that you can reach. If a bus captain came to me tonight and said, Preacher, tomorrow I'm going to have 200 on my bus route, I would not be a bit impressed or encouraged. Now, I would hope that he would do it, but I wouldn't believe that he would do it. Because I don't think the goal is realistic unless he's running 195 average. Then if he said, I'm going to have 200, I would say, Hey, I believe you will. But if he's only running 40 and says, Tomorrow I'm going to have 200, I would not be a bit impressed. I would think 
fellow, you don't know anything about goal setting. Now, I would hope that I'm wrong, and he would go out and have 200, but I don't think I'd be wrong. I think he might come back with 50 or 60 or 70. And a fellow keeps setting goals so high that he can't reach them, pretty soon he programs himself, well, I failed again, failed again, failed again, failed again. So those things, you need to, you need to learn how to do that. And that takes time. It takes time to learn. And how do you learn? You learn by failure. You bump your head enough going through that door, you're going to duck, aren't you? And pretty soon we move the door and you'll just duck anyway. The other day I, I was working on a refrigerator. We had to get a new refrigerator. And uh, I had the freezer door open. And I was down below, adjusting some things. And I raised up and hit my head. And I mean buckled right to the floor, you know. And you talk about hurt. And uh, I found, you know, I, watched, I noticed myself kind of being cautious. Just one bump will do it. And uh, so that's what will happen to you. you. You make enough mistakes, fail enough, and pretty soon you begin to adjust. And the same thing is true in goal setting. You miss enough of them, you make a fool out of yourself enough, pretty soon you'll get into to some realistic things, you know. And uh, things that are not realistic is instant success or instant riches. They're not realistic. You ever notice that in fantasy there are no negatives? Did you ever notice in fantasy there are no negatives? Whenever you fantasize about the future or, fa you know, infatuated and you fantas and, uh, you, and you, you dream and all these things, there are no negatives. I went to Bible college and worked at Pontiac Motors. I used to preach to thousands and all of them came and got saved and all of them tithed and all that kind of stuff. That was a fantasy. First of all, I don't preach to thousands. Secondly, they don't all come and get saved. And thirdly, they don't all tithe. You see? You fantasize. There are no negatives in a fantasy. But in the real world, they're there. And that's why many times folks want to escape from the real world. They just want to set and dream and set goals and do all this, but they don't want to ever deal with reality. Because it's not as much fun dealing with reality as it is dealing with fantasy. Reality is not always fun. Now, <clears throat> we need to understand there's a real problem. Problem number three in setting goals is the misunderstanding of setting financial goals. You know God is interested in your finances, yes. But God is interested in you and uh, more than he is your finances. And in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says to cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And God's not nearly as interested in you getting rich as you are. And I know about the success theology that's going on today with Kenneth Copeland and Casey Treat and Hagen and uh, Oral Roberts. And there is a brand of theology that is pervading American that I'll guarantee you is not in line with Scripture. It is a cult where a few Scriptures have been pulled out of context to use to show people that if you're not getting wealthy and getting rich and staying healthy, you're out of the will of God. That is, that is inconsistent with Scripture from the beginning to the end. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Turn to Hebrews chapter 11 sometime and read the Hall of Fame there and see how wealthy they were. They lived in caves. And I take issue with that because I think what it does is it frustrates many of God's people. And they cannot be content because they think they must be rich to be in the will of God. And they must be making millions to be in the will of God. You said, you like being poor? No, I don't like it. But do you know the truth is, when you, they did a survey of 100 millionaires. And out of 100, only one of them lived for God. The story was told of a fellow who owned five miles of timber for warehouser. He was a member in a Baptist church, and he had five, he had five miles of timber line. And they needed to, in this little church, they needed to raise some money for a building program. You know how much that fellow committed? Fifty cents a week. Now, I've been here long enough to know, I've been here long enough to know that it is not the rich people that contribute usually to the work of God. And I am not 
I, I used to be, when I first started my ministry, I was infatuated, impressed, and tried to cater to that crowd. Because I was, I was dumb and young and inexperienced, and I have learned that it is just the average, average working person who's committed to God who carries the work of God. You're wasting your time. You're chasing fleas. You say, well, you never had any millionaires. Oh, yeah, we had about three of them. About three of them. We had one, one person. <clears throat> Their taxes would have bought all of that piece of property. And they knew we were negotiating. And you don't know who I'm talking about. And we were negotiating on this piece of property right next door. Their taxes would have paid every bit of that piece of property. You know how much they gave toward it? You know how much they Nothing. Nothing. That's how they got their money. They keep it. Great. Now, I'm just simply saying that you probably will not be a better Christian. As, and, and another thing, I've watched success ruin more people than I have than, than failure. You know what happens to people when they lose their job? They pray. You know what happens to people when they get rich? They don't pray. Fellow gets fired and gets in trouble, gets in trouble at work, you know what he'll do? He'll call me up and say, Preacher, pray for me. Boy, my boss has just got his thumb on me. The guy gets a promotion, he forgets to pray. Matter of fact, he starts working Sunday. See? Success destroys far more people than failure. Now, if you've got enough grace and enough character to handle it, I'm for you, but I don't want anything to happen that's going to destroy you. I'd rather you just kind of stay on the bottom of a corporate ladder. Matter in the basement. You'd be better off in the basement if it'll keep you right with God. But now, some people can handle it, but about one out of a hundred is, is all that can handle it. About 99 others cannot handle it. It destroys them. Did you ever read in, in the psalm where he said, give me not riches lest I forget thee? That's what he said. I, here's, here's a man that said, don't make me rich because I don't think I can handle it. You say, oh, I'd like to try to handle it. I know, it shows your problem. But you try to handle what you got. Casting all your care upon him. Now, what kind of advice does the Bible give us about finances? Number one is we need to put God first in all things. Matthew 6, 33. You need to believe that God can meet your needs. My wife and I, I know you get tired of hearing it, but that's okay. My wife and I have been married 30 years. I went to Bible college for five years, and my wife has never had to work out. She works out, not because she has to, and she's never had to work out a day in her life, ever. Ever. And our kids just as well dressed as anybody. Not as well mannered, but well dressed. You know, you can't give them everything, so I give them clothes. But uh, <clears throat> but I'm just simply saying this. You see, you've got this thing overrated. You know, I've never in 48 years seen anybody starve to death. I've never seen a Christian starve. I'm sure folks do starve in some parts of the world. I'll guarantee you the average Christian's not starving. He's throwing enough in the garbage to feed another two or three families. And so you need to believe that God's going to meet your needs. And you say, well, what if God doesn't meet my needs? Well, you just die and go to heaven. Isn't that what would happen? You're going to die anyway, aren't you? Well, I'd rather die in the will of God because you're going to die anyway, so you might as well die in the will of God. So you need to set some goals in your financial areas. You need to set goals about uh, how much you're going to save. And you need to set some goals on how much you're going to give to your church. You need to set some goals on how you're going to live in your home. Now, some of you say, preacher, <laughs> setting goals is a big joke in our family because I don't even make enough to plan. Well, then you need to probably get the knife and start whittling and readjusting and you, I don't know. Every situation has to be evaluated. Everybody's different. I know when my preacher, one time he preached on tithing, and I said, I can't tithe. So he said, come on over to the house, and we looked at, sat down and went over my income and my outgo, and he just pushed himself back from the table, and he said, he said, Ken, I don't really think you can tithe. And boy, was I glad to hear that. I said, I told you. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, tithe anyway. Don't ever come to me and tell me that you cannot 
pay your tithes to God and take care of your obligations. Because do you think I'm going to tell you to rob God? And that's what the average guy does. He says, well, preacher, I know I'm supposed to tithe and I'm supposed to pay this guy owing 20 bucks. What do you think I ought to do? I think you ought to go soak your head. Don't come and ask me that question. That's like a guy saying, oh, now let's see, uh, I normally beat my wife on Thursday. What do you think I ought to do? You know, don't come and ask me if I, if, if I think you ought to obey God. Don't obey fear. Huh? Okay. That's not even in my notes. <clears throat> now, goals. People in the Bible set goals, and we're going to wind this up here. Abraham had a goal to follow God. He said, I'll go where you want me to. In Genesis chapter 12, God said to Abraham, leave your family in this and go here and go here. And Abraham set a goal and he went. Moses had a goal to rescue the Israelites and take them out of Egypt. And he took them three million strong. David had a goal. That was to fight Goliath and free the Jews. He said, is there not a cause? Elijah had a goal. That was to destroy Baal and the false gods. Elijah had a goal, and that was to carry on Elijah in Elijah's place. Jesus had a goal, and that was to seek and to save those who were lost. Now, number one, find out what God wants you to do. You can find that out through Bible study and prayer and counsel. Bible study, prayer, and counsel. Find out what does God want you to do. Then when you find out what God wants you to do, then start developing some goals, some steps that you can take to reach the overall goal. And it may take you years. We all, we live in an instant society. You know, make me rich now. Make me successful now. Make me healthy now. Make me this. It doesn't work that way, folks. It takes a lifetime. A lifetime and it's a process step by step but if you if those steps are in the will of God you can have contentment I know how this sounds to you but I was 20 years old in the first Baptist Church in Hope Lake Washington I was about 22 22 years old in the first Baptist Church over here in Hope Lake Washington and a missionary preached for people to surrender their life to God. And God spoke to my heart, and I came forward in that little church. Probably wasn't this many people in that church. Said, God can have my life. I'm going to use it for His glory. Now, I didn't know if I was going to, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about the future. I didn't know I was going to be a preacher, an evangelist, a missionary, a Sunday school teacher, a bus captain, a Boeing worker. That wasn't even in my mind. I didn't say, here's what I'm going to be. God, I hope you approve of it. You shouldn't say, God, make me a preacher. God, make me this. God, make me that. You should say, God, I will be what you want me to be. And if it's a doorkeeper in the house of God, I'll do it. That's the way you start. You don't start out and, and pick your, you don't pick your field and say, now God, bless it. You go to God and say, God, you pick my field. Here I am. And let me just tell you, from that time to this, I have never doubted what God wanted me to do. Never. 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 And then in the 17 years when God led me to the Linwood area to start a church, it, it has never crossed my mind that this is not where God wanted me to be. He said, do you ever think about quitting? Oh, yeah, every Monday. But it's never crossed my mind that this is not what God wanted me to do. So when you get the big picture, are you listening? This is the key. When you get the big picture within the will of God, you can start setting little goals to bring it about. But you've got to get the big picture first. What does God want me to do? Then you start picking those things that will make it happen. So God is in favor of goal setting, but you need to learn to be content in knowing what God's will for your life is, and I promise you, you can know God's will. You may not get it today 
or tomorrow, but if you'll desire it today or tomorrow, it'll come the next day or the next day. But let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for this.